Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. Um, welcome to welcome you on behalf of the Center for International Governance Innovation. My name is Una Fitzgerald, and I am the director of CG's International Law Research Program. And it's a real honor to be here tonight. I would like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of the CG Signature Lecture Series. Thanks for, to Wordsworth for providing us with author's books on sale in our lobby for many of our public lectures. Thanks also to all of you for joining us at this event, whether you are here as part of our live audience or the many joining us through our live webcast. Following this evening's address, we welcome questions from both audiences at the microphone here at CG or through the live chat function on your screen. So please remember to state your name and to keep your questions brief so we can get lots of time for answers. So I am now going to introduce our speaker tonight and it's a great pleasure for me. Our speaker is Dr. Thomas Cotier. Dr. Thomas Cotier is Emeritus Professor of European and International Economic Law at the University of Bern. He is a former managing director of the World Trade Institute and the Institute of European and International Economic Law, as well as former co-director of the National Research Program on Trade Law and Policy at, uh, located at the World Trade Institute. The uh, National Research Program on Trade Law and Policy that he directed was on international trade regulation from fragmentation to coherence. Dr. Cotier is an associate editor of several journals and currently teaches at Wuhan University, China, and the Europa Institute Saarbrücken, Germany. Um, he's been a visitor, visiting professor at the Graduate Institute in Geneva as well and um, other places. He was a member of the Swiss National Research Council from 1997 to 2004 and served on the board of the International Plant Genetic Resource Institute in Rome during the same period. He served the Baker and McKenzie law firm, served as one of their counsel from 1998 to 2005. So on top of all that, and before that, he also, Professor Cotier, had a long-standing involvement in the, the GATT and the World Trade Organization activities. He served on the Swiss negotiating team of the Uruguay round from 1986 to 1993, uh, first as chief negotiator on dispute settlement and subsidies for Switzerland, and subsequently as chief negotiator on TRIPS. He held several positions in the Swiss External Economic Affairs Department and was the Deputy Director General of the Swiss Intellectual Property Office. In addition to his conceptual work in the fields of services and intellectual property and legal counsel uh, role, he has also served as a member or chair of several GATT and WTO panels. So on top of all that, Dr. Cartier is a member of the advisory committee for CG's International Law Research Program. And on that committee, he is one of several um, distinguished uh, uh, academics and scholars in international law, providing strategic guidance and advice to the new program, which I direct. Um, most recently, Thomas Kochi has been visiting CG International Law Research Program professor at the University of Ottawa. Uh, he did that last month, and while he was in Ottawa, he, uh, he made a, num a couple of public presentations on issues of intellectual property law and trade and on climate change. So what, how could we sum up Dr. Cartier's intellectual uh, richness? There's a wonderful word in French, polyvalent, which I'm probably going to translate a bit improperly, but it really means that capacity to be multidimensional and to look at things from many, many angles and perhaps have many arms. Well, he's definitely polyvalent. He's an expert in intellectual property and innovation, um, trade, obviously, environmental law issues, even questions of equity and human rights. So he spans a really broad range of international law, all of which interests us greatly. So his talk today is on the common law of international trade and the future of the WTO. 
no doubt you will hear some very interesting views about the evolution of international law. Thank you. Let's give a hand to Thomas Cartier. Thank you. Thank you now for this um, very warm welcome and good evening. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here this afternoon, this evening, and to talk about questions of governance in trade. Trade upon which we all depend in our daily lives, but which often fails to see proper structures in decision making. And CG, I think, is one of the centers who is dedicated to think about how trade and governance structures should evolve. And this is the topic I would like to address uh, this evening. You may be feel familiar with this chart. This is a chart indicating the increase of so-called preferential trade agreements. You may recall that after World War II, we started off with the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which had some 47 members, which grew over time, but which was a multilateral order. Everybody played by the same rules. Uh, the principle of MFN uh, created level playing fields. In 57, the European integration started, and that was the first movement towards regional trade agreements with the um, uh, monitor, with the customs union. And over time, uh, the numbers increased. The next step was the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall. This triggered a great deal of preferential trade agreements, which then started to go beyond the region, actually into intercontinental preferential trade agreements. And today, we see uh, a large number of uh, such agreements. And actually, the action uh, and is, is, is in that camp. Governments invest in uh, creating new preferential trade agreements. That is equally true for, for Canada. And all this, of course, uh, leads to the question uh, what shall we do with the GATT? What shall we do with the WTO? Um, and I'd like to draw the attention to an important difference between perceptions and the realities of this organization. The perception is that uh, the World Trade Organization is in decline, is of declining importance for a number of factors which you see on, on the slide here. We are not able to make progress with the current Doha development agenda, which is on since 2001. Um, we see this shift to uh, these preferential trade agreements, particularly the uh, TTP on the Pacific and um, CETA, which we should add uh, on the Pacific side with European Union, the Americans with the TTIP and the um, Chinese with RCP. Uh, the world is no longer um, bilaterally dominated uh, on the Atlantic between the United States and the European Union. When it comes to trade, it's multipolar. There are many players who need to agree, and that is, makes things very difficult here. On the other hand, in terms of the realities, we should not forget that um, we have seen no major protectionism during the financial crisis and the debt crisis. If you compare this with the 1930s, where there was no multilateral system in place, it is like day and night. Um, while um, um, trade in the 1930s collapsed and was reduced uh, by 50 percent, we we've seen a slump of 10 percent, which recovered, and governments actually refrained from taking protectionist measures at a large scale. And this is thanks to the rules we find in, in the WTO. We also see uh, an increase of WTO members uh, over time since 1995 here. It's almost universal. And the centerpiece of this organization today is the dispute settlement system, 
which is very sophisticated and has been dealing with more than 500 disputes since 1995 here. And most of all, uh, WTO law is the true foundations of all these RTAs, these regional trade agreements. Um, you cannot read uh, the Canadian-European agreement, the CETA agreement, without referring back to the WTO and its foundational and its principles here. Um, the values and the basic norms are the same. They are derived from WTO law. Uh, the core concepts are the same. Uh, tariffs, quantitative restrictions, principles of non-discrimination here. If you look at the structure of these agreements, they essentially follow uh, the, the structure of the WTO. You have the same chapters. Uh, sometimes they simply repeat what is in the WTO. Sometimes they add. Uh, additional stuff to it, sometimes they even take things away, for example, in services, um, and they add on new areas, for example, regulations on labor, on environmental competition investment, uh, and then most recently on protecting uh, traditional knowledge. So there is new areas are evolving in these, uh, in these um, preferential agreements here, but they are all rooted in um, the WTO and these uh, fundamental principles. So please, um, when you read in the news, the WTO is not making progress, do not forget that it is the very foundation upon which the, all, the whole edifice rests, including the preferential uh, trade agreements here. It's also worthwhile looking a bit into the history, and we can describe this as a dialectical relationship between the multilateral system on the one hand and bilateral agreements on the other hand. For example, in the 19th century, uh, the first area where we've seen multilateral agreements is in the field of intellectual property. And these conventions, the Berne and the Paris conventions, they were based upon a host of bilateral agreements which were concluded prior to that among European states to foster copyright and trademark uh, laws. So you had a critical mass to actually come up with a multilateral framework here. And the same was true for the GATT. The GATT of 1947 was built upon the US uh, reciprocal trade agreements, which evolved under the Roosevelt administration as of 1934. And some of the language we still have in the GATT and today in the WTO uh, comes directly from, from, these, uh, from these agreements here. We see also the other way around, for example, in services. In services, we started to build new disciplines in the Uruguay round. They didn't exist in um, preferential trade agreements before, except for um, the European Union. And um, during the negotiations and services, the first chapter was incorporated into the NAFTA, and from there it got into, into the, um, into, um, uh, the preferential trade agreements here. So the start was multilateral and then branched out here. And today we're back in a phase where we essentially work with preferential trade agreements. These are in the news, they make the news here, and uh, we can expect that these, the results of these agreements will uh, go back into, uh, into the multilateral system in the time period of 2020 to 2030. Uh, the, the elephant in the room here is uh, China. Uh, China is operating or is being dealt with at the moment uh, under a doctrine of encircling. Um, the American president would say that um, we need a TTP in order to be able to make the rules, otherwise others will make the rule. It's a question of time when China will have to come in uh, to be as a full partner in this. And, and I, I expect this will be the case when we start multilateralizing uh, these uh, results here. Another interesting uh, dimension is looking back into history uh, and to reflect a little bit, what does it take to build a solid system? What does it take to build governance in this global field? Governance which we know on local levels, on provincial level, on national levels with our governments here. And my message here is that um, 
governance and institution, governance and the law um, depend on strong institutions. We can, we can take the example of Roman law and the way uh, the glossatores in the 11th century started to work on it, to uh, systematize it, to codify it, which prepared the ground for um, the civil codes on the European uh, continent here. Um, we, can, we can look at the formation of the common law in England, which was essentially dependent on a very strong central role of the King's Bench here. Without the King's Bench, the common law could not have been created here. We can, we can think of modern federalism, um, the building of uh, uh, modern states like Canada, the United States, Switzerland, Germany. Um, they all... Um, uh, they all depend on, on strong central institutions, and to the extent the central institutions fail on lack, um, um, uh, the governance is not really, really assured here. It's not only about institutions in the government sense, it's also about uh, scholarship. So, for example, um, the, um, the process of modern codification civil law in Europe was essentially a process which was driven by scholars, by researchers at the time, and then got into, into um, um, the lawmaking uh, process. And you also need um, a strong civil society support. So I was looking at the ad for this uh, talk this evening, which uh, really comes from the period where a lot of people were resenting the WHO, were considering uh, the WHO as a threat here. I think we have moved on uh, from this stage. Uh, people rather perceive uh, preferential trade agreements as this kind of threat and consider the WTO as a foundation which is perhaps a little bit more even than uh, some, of these, some of these agreements here. But it is obvious without the support of civil society uh, these institutions cannot work, cannot flourish and so we need to, we need to work on that here. Now, when we look at the institutions of these preferential trade agreements, which are now flourishing, which are coming up, like the TTP, uh, with the exception of the European Union, they have no institutions. The TTP, which uh, will be discussed in this country, has no secretariat, um, it has no um, uh, central body, it has no permanent dispute settlement uh, staff who could uh, acquire expertise. It's really, it's really built upon the tradition of 19th century ad hoc arbitration. And we will see that this probably is going to be uh, quite weak. Uh, we can also compare with NAFTA. It's not an accident that the disputes between Canada and the United States are mainly carried uh, to Geneva and they're not dealt with in NAFTA because in Geneva you have uh, the strong institutions who have the expertise to deal with these, uh, with these uh, disputes here. So when we look at the relationship between the WTO today and these uh, preferential trade agreements like the TTP, uh, we, can, we can say that uh, this is a situation of uh, splendid isolation. They, uh, they, they relate to each other uh, the preferential trade agreements are built upon the WTO, but in terms of institution, they do not, they do not interconnect here. So, for example, when you have a dispute um, which you bring um, in Geneva under the WTO, a WTO panel is not allowed to look into any aspect of these preferential trade agreements. And vice versa, if you bring a dispute under uh, a preferential trade agreement, uh, that panel would not be allowed to look into uh, the WTO rules, in particular um, claims beyond uh, simply taking it into account and the so-called uh, so um, uh, Vienna Convention uh, on Treaties Rules on Interpretation here. The, basically, the two fields are, are quite isolated and that, that may cause uh, quite interesting problems. Um, and I'd like to, to give you the example of uh, protecting geographical indications in Canada. This is a, 
a concept which came in from uh, Europe. It's a particular form of intellectual property protection where you um, grant protection to special products, mainly foodstuffs, who, who originate in a particular region and who own their quality to that particular uh, region here. So um, I think maple syrup could be a... If you have a, a region where a special maple syrup uh, comes from, then that could be a, a typical GI of this country. Now, the rules on GIs are different in the TRIPS agreement, in the NAFTA agreement, in the CETA agreement, and in the TTP agreement. And it must be a headache for the Canadian government to actually come up with the legal rules who will fit all these, uh, all these um, um, uh, agreements. So with the Europeans, they would uh, have to protect some of the uh, uh, products under the CETA agreement. And under the TTP agreement, they would have to allow these products in when exported uh, from the United States into Canada here. So it's really about squaring the circle, and uh, it shows uh, that we have to overcome uh, this kind of uh, uh, splendid um, isolation here. My, my suggestion to do this would actually be to uh, further develop the dispute settlement system in the WTO to become a world trade court. At the moment, uh, we can only bring claims based upon the WTO dispute, uh, WTO agreements, but we cannot take into account uh, other agreements and rely upon those for bringing claims. But uh, we could design a system where basically uh, the architecture, the expertise could be used in Geneva also to address disputes uh, under these um, preferential trade agreements. It's, it's a little bit like uh, heart surgery. If you need heart surgery, you go to a center which has the expertise which does heart surgery every week. You don't go to a county hospital where they do this every five years. Um, and it's a bit the same idea, and we could work on that. And I think it could be uh, one, one strategy to, to reinforce uh, the central role of the WTO in terms of international institution uh, building in the sense I was alluding to um, in, that historical, uh, in that historical reference. Of course, uh, we would need to change the system. We would need to renegotiate some of these... Uh, agreements, and we would also have to change the cost structures, um, but I think it could become uh, a function which uh, would make a lot of sense in reinforcing uh, stability in global governance here. Now, beyond that, I think we, the question is, how can we further strengthen uh, the role of the WTO um, in, in, in given the situation today here? Um, I think one role which is very, very interesting is the um, monitoring of existing agreements here. Um, we have, we have um, the so-called trade policy re review mechanism. Uh, this is a, a system where every country reports uh, regularly um, on its uh, trade policy and there is a, a a part of the report produced by the Secretariat, another part by the government, and then these reports are being discussed. And these reports are very useful, first of all, to um, oblige different uh, departments in, in the government to discuss with each other, uh, to uh, draw the attention to potential problems, and um, then to discuss them also with the trading partners here. And this function, this function uh, could, be, could be further uh, elaborated here. We could also think of uh, giving uh, the secretariat in the WTO, that may be a bit of a technical point for you, uh, a proper voice in, the, in, 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 in disputes settlement. For the moment, uh, we operate under the premises that the WTO is a member-driven organization. You hardly should see the secretariat, but they play a very important role in that role should be um, a more transparent, uh, a little bit like the uh, Commission in, in the European Union, who is the defender, essentially, of integration and the system. Um, and then, uh, 
the secretary could also become the right actually to uh, launch uh, consultations and uh, complaints against uh, failing uh, members. That would be uh, a further step, how this could be uh, developed here. Now, next to the institutional questions here, I think the core question is, um, what, what should the WTO do uh, in the next decade, given the situation that most of the market access issues actually move uh, the, towards these preferential trade agreements, given the geopolitical constellations of, of this world here. And uh, we have to face it that the traditional role of the most favored nation clause has somewhat changed. The um, MFN clause was uh, the condition of uh, Roosevelt in the Atlantic Charter uh, to support Great Britain in the war effort. And the MFN clause had the goal to dismantle the European colonial uh, system, including tariff preferences uh, for, for and by Canada here. And this program, of course, has been largely uh, realized, and uh, Europe has uh, moved on and, and works in very different formats than at this time here. And we have uh, the, the, the elephant in the room with China where people don't want to engage in MFN, uh, further MFN trade because China reaped a lot of the benefits of the Uruguay round when they, changed, when they uh, adhered in 2001 and many countries uh, had hoped to gain better market access, for example, in the field of textiles, which then went to um, China. So developing countries either are reluctant to do that here. So we have to take it that the so-called market access issues, uh, reduction of um, tariffs and reduction of quantitative restrictions, etc., uh, will will essentially stay uh, with these uh, with these preferential trade uh, trade agreements here. Now, the, the di more difficult part uh, than these tariff reductions are the so-called uh, non-tariff barriers here, and. Um, in these, uh, in these preferential trade agreements, uh, countries today deal increasingly uh, and in the forefront with these non-tariff uh, measures. It's, it's about making common rules. It's about uh, bringing about uh, mutual recognition or equivalence of uh, regulatory, regulatory regimes here. And to, to a large extent, um, countries um, in preferential trade agreements uh, will do that um, to the effect and to the very point that they do not actually uh, face too many free riders who will then benefit from uh, these preferential, uh, preferential uh, arrangements here. And this is what we call the so-called spillover effects. The, the regulatory uh, convergence between um, let's say Canada and the European Union, will also benefit third parties. They will benefit from um, the fact that the rules are being harmonized and uh, product standards are being um, made similar on both sides of the Atlantic. That increases their market access. But Canada and the EU do, do not get anything in return. So they to a certain extent, will be willing to take these free riders into account, but to, to a, a certain extent, they will not. And one of the most important areas where they do not actually are willing to take uh, these free riders into account is when we talk about uh, disciplines on domestic support, subsidy questions. In none of these preferential trade agreements is very sophisticated advanced negotiations today do we talk about domestic support agricultural support, uh, support for energy, support, uh, energy products, etc. Uh, because if you would agree among the two, others would have uh, very extensive free riding effects, which uh, these countries want to avoid here. So the, the question is, uh, what should the WTO do? What are the unique selling propositions, what are the topics the WTO should take on in this game where market access essentially with preferential trade agreements here, um, and, and, and 
what are the areas we should tackle on in the so-called post-Doha agenda, uh, in a new trade agenda, in the era of uh, climate change uh, uh, mitigation and adaptation measures here. Now, if we look at these USPs of the WHO, the multilateral system, I think it's really, first of all, the institutional framework. That's a strength of the system here. Uh, the expertise you find in the WHO, in the Secretariat, but also in the missions in Geneva and the group of NGOs who actively think about these issues here and provide input. And many developing country has learned that they're, and are learning, that they are better off actually working within the multilateral system than being picked up and picked on uh, bilaterally outside, uh, outside of Geneva here. So I think this uh, civil society and diplomatic community in Geneva is, is an important um, USP uh, for work in, in the multilateral system here. And then we have to address the areas where we see strong spillover effects. And these are the ones we should tackle uh, in the WTO. Um, I'll, I'll take the example of um, subsidies, so agricultural subsidies, that's what we've done so far. We need to continue to do that there because nobody else uh, does it. But um, we have to develop um, disciplines on subsidies also in the services area. For example, um, airlines of Europe and North America are increasingly under pressure because um, other airlines are heavily subsidized and distort the market. We don't have the disciplines in place. It will be a matter to take that up in WTO negotiations in the next decade here. Um, we will see further work on the field of intellectual property uh, rights, uh, which is a, a framework condition. Uh, just also for the fact, because under the TRIPS agreement, every improvement of intellectual property you uh, conclude bilaterally has to be extended to everybody, and that is a big free rider effect you may want to avoid. We may discuss antitrust rules, uh, competition policy in, in the WTO, uh, investment issues um, in, the, in the next phase. We will um, deal with um, technical regulation, food standards, which need to be the same for everybody. You can't have food standards for one country and a different food standard for another country. You have one standard and it's safe or not safe. Um, so these things uh, have to be uh, done um, centrally, uh, in my view. What we will see is a farewell to the classical uh, trade rounds where you basically um, try to create the momentum through tariff reductions. Um, tariffs are no longer in the WTO. They will be dealt with in the preferential trade agreements here. And um, the same is true um, for um, large packages um, in the field of um, services here. I think what we will see are so-called sectorial negotiations and ongoing quasi-legislative uh, processes. So the WTO will become um, more like a normal international organization who will have an ongoing agenda and ongoing, um, ongoing negotiating uh, processes. And th that is not necessarily new. Uh, we have seen this uh, after the uh, Eurogo round in financial services, where uh, a deal was um, negotiated. We've seen it with a telecom so-called reference paper. We have seen recently a revision of the government procurement agreement, and we have seen a revision um, uh, of the TRIPS agreement uh, allowing uh, for a facilitated access to uh, essential drug and um, export um, uh, export possibilities for generic, uh, generic drugs to uh, developing uh, countries. So this is not something which is entirely new, but it, 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 so far we have worked with these eight trade rounds and uh, the ninth round we probably will have to conclude uh, decently, but we have to move on into these, uh, into these new areas. These new uh, sectoral negotiations will also no longer uh, make these clear distinctions between goods, services, intellectual property, 
our investment, which so far has been essentially the rule, but they will uh, be grouped around um, a theme and uh, will we'll take into account all the disciplines which are necessary to address a particular problem, for example, um, in the field of uh, climate change mitigation and climate change uh, adaptation here. Now, the sectors where I see uh, potential for uh, future WTO um, negotiations is in the energy field. I think uh, we might want to uh, think about an agreement on electricity, um, which entails uh, a framework for um, uh, long-distance um, trade on uh, sustainably produced electricity. Um, we need to work a system which links up the different regional grids, which allows to exchange uh, solar and wind energy among larger areas, and the new technology uh, allows for this. And we have a number of legal problems to solve here, uh, interconnection, um, um, a typical uh, network and pipeline uh, problem. So that would be a specific uh, specific agreement. We, we might have an agreement on fossil fuels. Um, this is essentially a subsidy agreement. We still have, in this age of climate change, 400 to 600 billion US dollars in terms of subsidies going to the fossil fuel industry here. Uh, some of this is production, some of this is consumption, but these things need to be gradually reduced, and that could be done within such an agreement here. We may also see an agreement on extracted minerals here. This is um, particularly um, how to secure uh, the procurement with um, essential minerals for IT industries. It's essentially about um, export restrictions um, in, in this particular field. We may see a specific services agreement. I already mentioned civil aviation, the airlines. Uh, we may uh, finally liberalize maritime transports, which are still operating under uh, monopoly rights here. And we may have to take migration beyond uh, the current GATS disciplines, where migration rights are limited just to leading personnel of companies, but we may have to put this in a broader framework um, in, in, in the multilateral system here. All this is not the idea that this would be exclusively done within the WTO. This requires cooperation with um, other international organizations. Many of them are in Geneva, some are in other, 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 other towns and other continents, but I think uh, it's only uh, with the institution, with that secretariat, uh, that you're actually able to develop uh, uh, the close working relationship with the specialized international organizations. This is a field which really um, can, can be further um, uh, developed uh, in the coming in the coming decade here. Um, now, apart from these uh, sectorial uh, negotiations, which uh, there may be others, but this, these are the ones I, I think uh, one could identify of being of great interest in, in this agenda, uh, also uh, for climate um, change mitigation and adaptation. There are a number of uh, horizontal issues one would need to. Uh, take into account. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, trade remedies. Now, trade remedies are measures against dumping, uh, against subsidization, uh, and the tool we use are increased uh, tariffs, import tariffs. Now, this doesn't work uh, for services. We don't know the concept of tariffs for services, so we need to have a new system. And how do you address uh, anti-dumping um, in, in a domestic context, if a company dumps within Canada, um, I guess in Europe that would be a question of unfair competition. So we need to develop the rules of unfair competition, and we have the foundations for this in the TRIPS and the Paris Convention, but it's dormant. It's not being really used so far, and there is a mandate to develop uh, uh, disciplines on subsidies in services, but it hasn't really been uh, put to uh, work uh, so far. So there is there's quite a bit of work conceptually where also uh, centers like the CG can make a very important uh, intellectual contribution. Um, I think we have to come to grips with trade and investment. 
Um, I think the goal would be to integrate uh, investment into the WTO. I personally see a model where we operate like in the TRIPS agreement, that um, you set up and set out a number of minimal standards. CETO, the Canada-EU agreement, is a very good example of actually uh, developing such minimal standards. And, um, and um, basically, uh, investment disputes would be adjudicated by domestic courts. But if they don't comply with these uh, minimal standards, you could bring a complaint before the WTO. This would be a way to go around this uh, current dispute uh, we have on uh, private state investor um, arbitration, which is very controversial among industrialized countries, but which is also controversial, increasingly controversial um, among uh, developing countries who, who um, think they're coming of age and they no longer need to depend on this uh, uh, private state uh, um, arbitration uh, system here. Uh, we may move into uh, antitrust rules. Uh, it's a bit odd when you have a system in, with very, very strong intellectual property rights in the WTO, but you have no antidotes, uh, which we normally have at home, which is uh, um, the abuse of a dominant position. Uh, you can break the abuse of a dominant position by referring to competition policy. We have made a lot of progress in countries. Countries are more advanced. We have now about 65 countries having competition acts, and so maybe the time comes to start negotiation on the things here. And then I think there are institutional issues. As I said, the role of the Secretariat, um, a more proactive role, uh, more accountable, um, more defending uh, assist the system with its own voice here. Uh, the idea of creating a World Trade Court by extending jurisdiction to the um, regional trade agreements and the elaboration of cooperation with international organization. We still operate in the silos uh, when it comes to different international organizations, even though they may be next door. So the, the World Meteorological Organization is about 100 meters away from the WTO. But they, there's no interaction between, and the WTO is very badly prepared to take up uh, climate change issues at this stage. They never talked about these things. Um, or I'm, I'm currently involved in the World Health Organization uh, advising on um, the, the consequences which you'd draw um, from SARS and other epidemics, uh, and possibly the one which is going on now. Um, but there is very little discussion among these different organizations. So we need to get this act together and we need to come to structures so uh, that, these, that these agencies start working uh, with each other in addressing these complex issues. The WTO will always play an important role, even though we may deal with energy or the environment or health because uh, when governments use trade tools, uh, restrictions of trade, uh, regulating products, etc., they fall into the domain of the WTO, and we will end up in the dispute settlement uh, there. So there's nothing wrong with this here, but it requires that we work together. It's also true for labor standards. It's true for human rights. These, this cooperation has to, has to be reinforced. So there's a lot lot of work which could be done next to all these preferential trade agreements which we, which we uh, see. In order to make this work, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have to rethink uh, the modus of uh, consensus diplomacy. While the GATT and the WTO rules on paper uh, work with majority rules, in practice, there's only uh, consensus. So something is agreed if nobody actually openly disagrees. That doesn't necessarily mean that they agree, but they do not disagree, and so the deal is done here. But it gives every country formally the right to raise the finger and says, no, uh, I don't agree, I don't want this here. And a lot of countries think that is the most democratic thing. Uh, I can object if I don't want. And uh, many developing countries have actually used this power and stopped um, our progress, uh, and that is one of the reasons why uh, little, little um, uh, progress uh, was made in the uh, uh, Doha round. But they, they also learned 
uh, of course, that some are more equal than others, and it's difficult to sustain um, um, objections um, in the long run. That, that only large powers, uh, large powers can do. And in fact, many of the problems we face today are rather due to large powers than smaller powers here. So the large powers have to uh, also rethink their attitudes to um, uh, consensus. Now, there are different models. One can formalize uh, a weighted voting system. There are models uh, that every country would have a certain number of base votes and additional votes, and you take into account uh, trade dependency and others, and that could work. But um, uh, that's probably uh, too early to discuss. Uh, what we may um, um, see is uh, just a new mode that before somebody actually um, um, raises uh, an objection to consensus, that they would have to justify that, that it should only be for vital interests, um, and uh, that it would need confirmation upon a cooling uh, period here. Um, this is the, the small steps one perhaps can, can make. This is more a way of uh, changing the modes of diplomacy than actually changing the rules. But we need a new, a new attitude uh, in, in the game here. And I think the experience many countries make with negotiating preferential trade agreements, where it's much more difficult to actually defend your interests vis-a-vis -vis the large powers, may bring them back into, uh, into um, a system where flexible coalitions are possible and where you may be able to defend your interest on average better than uh, on, the bilateral, on the bilateral avenue here. So this um, brings me to, to the end here. Um, what I wanted to uh, say uh, today is um, uh, that we, we should not believe that the WTO law, uh, the WTO has lost its role because um, uh, current negotiations are in difficulties. It plays a very, very uh, pivotal role as uh, the center of all these principles and rules and as the center of dispute settlement in the multilateral uh, trading uh, system here. And institutions like CG help to actually forge what I call here the common law of international trade, of integrating uh, the WTO rules with those of the preferential trade agreements and to forge uh, a more coherent system which uh, may overcome uh, also this um, institutional splendid isolation of the preferential trade agreements in which we currently find ourselves here. I think there is a need to strengthen central institutions. I think uh, if we want to have stability, predictability, if we want to have the rule of law in a highly interdependent world, uh, in this process of globalization, we need to harness globalization, and we can only do this uh, by law and with, with strong institutions. And I think the WTO is the place where we should invest and not disinvest to achieve uh, these, these goals here. I think we should shift our minds to sectorial negotiations. We should have a process also in Canada. Which are the priorities where the Canadian government should invest? What are the areas where they should develop initiatives? Where do we need to, to move forward? Um, and to prepare these, uh, these negotiations. And we need a more flexible attitude uh, to um, agreement. Uh, we need some sort of a qualified consensus. In a multipolar world where you have six to seven major powers, uh, we can no longer afford that a single one can simply block. It's as simple as that. However we do that, that's, um, that's a, de a question of detail, but we, we need, we need a, a different attitude here and uh, a different perception. So this is what I wanted to, to briefly um, um, convey to you. Uh, perhaps for, for some of you it was uh, too, too technical, uh, but I, I think the main message of the need for strong institutions, if you believe in the rule of law, is something which I hope you will take home uh, tonight. Thank you. So I'm I'm uh, happy uh, to to um, take your questions if you if you have any.
on, on these matters. Hey, uh, thank, thank you very much. That was an excellent overview of uh, the WTO currently. Um, and I really appreciated some of the suggestions about um, moving forward. The one issue which wasn't on your quite comprehensive agenda was the exchange rate issue. And so this has come up in the TPP uh, context. So one of your messages is you could sometimes take things from the TPP or TTIP and put them back into the WTO at a future moment. Um, so the TPP now has a side agreement on exchange rates. And it does seem like an issue that the IMF has really not been able to tackle with any effectiveness. And it relates to your issue about developing country discontent about China's uh, reaping the benefits of the Uruguay round. Yeah. So I wondered why um, you left that off the agenda. Is it something that you think is just too difficult for the WTO to, uh, to address? Well, thank you. This is a, this is a very interesting point. Um, I, I basically think that the work on the exchange rate uh, policy should be located and done within the International Monetary Fund. The reason why we discuss these issues in the trade field is simply because within the IMF we have no dispute resolution mechanism whatsoever. If one country says, I don't want this exchange rate issue on the agenda, it's not on. And uh, the, the only progress in the IMF which was possible was to actually have a, an official exchange rate statistics which is now being put out. But uh, it doesn't go beyond that. So that's why uh, um, if, if um, people fear about um, depreciation and devaluation, they bring it into the trade field because you, you may slap on uh, import tariffs on, on these products here. This is what has been done in the States in the 70s, and that's the reason why we essentially discuss it in the trade field. But when you take it further and then it affects services, the, the, uh, the tariff angle doesn't really work, so the remedy doesn't really work. So I think uh, the G20 should rather focus on how to improve uh, the mechanisms within the International Monetary Fund to, to address the exchange rates than to, to try to locate this in a, in a, in a trade field. It's also doubtful whether uh, exchange rates can actually be qualified as a subsidy in the legal sense, because a subsidy has to be specific uh, to the benefit of a specific industry or companies, and exchange rates, um, they have an advantage for the um, export industry, like a low Canadian dollar has is an advantage for the Canadian export industry, a disadvantage for the importers, and all of you who need to buy fruits, um, but it's not specific in the legal sense. So I'm not sure whether that is really going to work. I, I haven't studied the, uh, I haven't studied the side agreement, and I, I will do that. But um, I wonder to what extent it's hard law, and to what extent it's just a consultation mechanism. Oh, there, there's a question on the screen here, okay. Uh, the WTO held its first ministerial conference in Africa. How does, could, should the WTO address dis disparities between developing and developed countries? Well, this is a, this is a very good question. I didn't, I didn't address uh, that specifically here. We are operating currently under the so-called special and differential treatment. So developing countries have uh, sometimes uh, lesser obligations or they have temporary relief from some obligations and um, um, that is expressed in these so-called special and differential uh, treatment uh, rules. Uh, the downside of this is that special and differential treatment also um, uh, prolongs the uh, process of integration. If you don't have international obligations, you don't adjust, and so you have a decollage that, uh, between developed and developing countries um, due to that. So basically, there is agreement that this special differential treatment does not really work very, very well here. And other, other options are being um, tested. I personally uh, think we should move into a system of graduation where Basically, uh, within an agreement, a country assumes certain responsibilities once it's actually actively playing on the world stage and in the world market, and, but before that, maybe exempt from, from certain obligations. But once it's 
as I said, develops, then I think the, the rules should, should kick in. And this is how we, we might, be, might be able in the rules to, to address disparities between these countries. There's also a lot of work to be done in sort of training. Uh, I think the WTO does a lot of training work, uh, institution building, uh, and that, of course, uh, should, should go on. Also, uh, in uh, trade promotion, uh, there's a recent trade facilitation agreement which was concluded, and, and that should help countries um, to... to um, improve uh, their trade. The true problem, however, for most of the many developing countries still remains that they lack products which are tradable on the global level. And so product development would be an essential function, but that is beyond, that is beyond the, the, the scope of, uh, of the WTO at this stage here. I don't know whether that responded to the question. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, good evening. It's Amy Ryer with Miller Thompson in Waterloo. I have several questions for you this evening. Okay. But first, let me just thank you for being here. We really appreciate you being in this jurisdiction. Um, I think I'll limit my questions just to perhaps two general ones. I was curious to know how the World Trade Organization might address or integrate the RUGGY principles, human rights, environmental issues, in particular dealing with dispute resolution, dispute settlement, and my second question is with respect to the applicability of the common law of international trade in domestic courts and or perhaps the vice versa of domestic courts deferring to the World Trade Organization. Um, clearly jurisdiction is something that needs to be addressed, but how willing uh, will nations be and how long do you think that will happen? In so, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for, for two questions, which I think could be another, another um, presentation. Um, but they're very, very, very pertinent. Um, um, the the Ruggie principles are um, these uh, commitments by companies uh, essentially um, to um, comply with, with certain human rights related, labor standard related uh, principle in terms of a self-commitment. And these principles are essentially considered to be um, um, soft law. Um, some people would consider them simply marketing tools, but um, I think we, we, uh, we need to look uh, how, as you said, how the WTO could, could deal with uh, these kind of commitments. And in my view, the, the foundation here could be to use the principles of unfair competition, which we have in the TRIPS agreement in Article 10 bis of the Paris Convention, and to uh, use those to enforce uh, these commitments. So once a company um, make such a pledge, and they do not live up to it, uh, they should be liable under unfair competition rules here. This is a way which uh, was taken in the United States with the, um, uh, with the um, uh, shoe case, um, and it could be, could be used as well in, 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 on the international level. Um, generally speaking, on, on uh, Trade and environment, I think we made a lot of progress uh, in the case law. If you look at the 1990s uh, and you compare to the situation today, I think we, I would argue we have a very balanced system between uh, trade interests and uh, environmental interests, uh, which are, which are uh, weighed um, in, in the dispute settlement system. So the break, the, the leading case was uh, this rim turtle decision. Uh, but also, if you look at the recent case, uh, EC Seals, which of course was to the detriment of Canada, but which I think in terms of uh, uh, promoting uh, these um, non-trade concerns is, is, a, is, a, is, is quite a big, a big step. As to the, the role of law of WTO, the WTO law in domestic courts, that's a very, very good question. Um, those countries uh, operating under the Westminster system like Canada, uh, do not allow their courts basically to directly refer to uh, WTO rules. They, they, they operate under a dualist system. Other countries like Holland or Switzerland, the courts are allowed to uh, use the WTO law as the law of the land, and they have done so. Um, that would also be the, the case in the United States, but uh, the US Congress has explicitly barred a direct effect of trade agreements and U.S. courts are not allowed to, to do that. So what, what under these circumstances can be done is you can, 
use the doctrine of consistent interpretation. So as an attorney pleading before a Canadian court, you can use uh, trade agreements and say, a judge, would you please uh, interpret the rules in the way so that they're compatible with these agreements? And this is the way how you can import uh, this. Um, but it takes uh, the people who know the subject, and a lot of lawyers have no clue. So uh, it, um, it's a matter of education. And um, in Europe, and I think also in Canada, we're a bit behind uh, in law schools and coping with globalization. We're still very much focusing on the nation state. And uh, so we need to push this envelope. But I think there are ways to get into this. But uh, as long as you have this dualist system, there are certain limits. Is that, did I answer the questions like this? OK, thank you. Um, there's another question. Uh, to remain relevant, apart from PTA agreement, does the WTO need to broaden its agenda to include issues like intellectual property, climate and health? Um, I think the answer is yes. I mean, we already broadened this uh, to intellectual property. That, that was done in the Europe by round, where this was introduced uh, with the TRIPS agreement. Um, I think we, we deal um, with health issues as, as, as to, the, to the extent that um, medication and equipment is, uh, is, is, is concerned. And I think the climate question will open up a host of uh, new issues. Uh, I mentioned uh, the energy sector, but um, the most important part here on climate change and mitigation will be to make progress on technology transfer. Um, what we see is a, is a mega trend, ladies and gentlemen, that we compare products increasingly on the basis of how they are produced, not uh, how they are. Traditionally, we would consider physical property as the main um, criterion. But today, increasingly, we ask whether a product is being made in a sustainable manner or not. And we start distinguishing these products on that basis. And we call this the so-called PPMs, the production process methods. And if you go down this road, uh, you privilege uh, clean technologies. And the clean technologies are mainly developed in industrialized countries. So the cleavage with uh, developing countries increases. Uh, while, while most of the production is in these uh, uh, developing countries today. So we have a, a genuine interest to make the technology available uh, to these countries and then operate with these PPM distinctions. But we don't have the tools at hand uh, for this transfer of technology because the technology is in the hand of the private companies. They depend on the, the intellectual property. They can't just give that away. And unless we find new funding mechanisms through tax breaks or uh, public-private partnerships, uh, this, this, this will not happen. And I see this is the climate, uh, from your question, the climate area is really an area where we need to redesign the mandate, and, and that will open uh, quite a number of issues uh, which uh, are not yet on the list. Please, yes. Thank you very much, Professor Cotier, for this uh, conference. Um, I have two sub-questions relating to the unique position of Canada uh, currently. Canada is one of the only country who is part of, who has concluded negotiations uh, with two mega regional agreements, the TPP and CETA. Um, so the first question I would ask regarding the role, well, the, the expectation of ex extending the jurisdiction of WTO to include this uh, regional trade agreement, I was wondering if you were expecting any specific role from Canada in this regard. And also the second sub-question would be if you were expecting any change in the strategy of Canada when it was going, well, in future trade dispute eventually, considering its participation in these mega trade uh, regional trade agreements, and WTO as well. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, I, I, uh, these are only reflections from, from a systemic point of view without an agenda, uh, what a particular country like Canada uh, should and could do. I think it's very early on this, and one has to take up uh, the work. But I, I could imagine that uh, Canada would be actually better off uh, 
uh, in disputes, um, if uh, a, a panel would be allowed to take all these agreements into account in a particular setting and try to find a solution which accommodates uh, them uh, to the utmost extent. Uh, certainly, Canada is better off to bring disputes in the WTO. They have done so consistently, not using our NAFTA panels, and I think the same, uh, the same equation could work with the European Union. Um, I think you're, that the institutional capacity in the WTO to address these issues, the neutrality, etc., is, is better than in these ad hoc arbitrations uh, which, which are now uh, on, in, on the design here. So we'll have to see how, how they will, use, will be used. But I think in, in, in terms of uh, working towards uh, uh, the type of a world court, I think it would certainly be interesting if Canada would study the question and see uh, whether, whether such a step could be supported in, in, in the next decade, given its multiple um, um, agreements, which partly are contradictory and which are difficult to bring under one hat. Okay, can you expand more upon potential electricity sector negotiations at the WTO you raised earlier? Um, yes. Um, I think the the bottom line is that if we want to, if we want to uh, shift towards renewable energy, wind and solar, uh, this has to be partly produced at least where the comparative advantage for these uh, electricity generators is. So south for the solar energy, the north uh, with the wind, um, and then you need uh, to bring uh, the electricity over long distances into the centers where they are used. Uh, physicists tell us that uh, it's only a combination of local production and long distance trade, and distance production will allow us to create the necessary base load without being dependent upon coal or potentially atomic energy here. So I think uh, uh, the negotiations uh, in, on electricity would, uh, would deal with the uh, interconnection, um, the pipeline, um, the, the, the grid, uh, the network industry, uh, the network industry um, elements. Uh, we, we have some experience in the European Union how difficult this may be. Um, uh, also the trading of electricity and the use of the grids, all these things need to be um, assessed internationally. I, I personally, I, I spoke to this two years ago in Canada, uh, that I think there could be a vision of a global grid, that we build up the grids, that we interconnect the grids, that we also use uh, these uh, seabed cables, and that we help to stabilize also the electricity situation in many developing countries who still suffer from a lot of shortages here. But we need to build uh, the framework to do this. Uh, the other issue is about the um, subsidy question. I think you cannot work towards sustainable um, electricity if we do not tackle uh, the fossil fuel subsidies, and that could uh, also be part of, a, of an agreement on electricity, but uh, or parallel to it, as I mentioned, in another, in another format. There's another question, but I, I only get the second part of it, so I don't know whether it can be scrolled up. Uh, oh, okay. Two reasons why TTP is dreaded by Canadians is that it eliminates domestic content requirements for autos, putting jobs at risk, and it undermines farmers by opening dairy to imports without new export markets. How do we respond to uh, these concerns? Um, I think the... I don't know. The uh, domestic content requirements for automobiles is already... Um, illegal under the um, WTO rules. So I don't know whether the TTP actually adds uh, obligation uh, to this effect here. Um, and um, it undermines farmers by opening dairy to import without new export markets. Um, it may... may uh I think the answer to this, if you open agricultural products, 
This is the same uh, problem in my own country, Switzerland, which is highly protectionist in agriculture. If you want to, if you, if you um, remove these trade barriers, I think one has to actively think what are the special products uh, Canada could offer to the world in terms of uh, exports in the sector. So is there a potential to go into uh, special products, cheese products, other products, uh, which could be sold on the world market. This is what other countries are doing with this uh, geographical indication strategy, basically developing specialities here, which you then uh, go on to the market here. And, um, and that is essentially an active response one can give uh, in res in if, if, if you open up um, formally protected markets. Thank you. Any, any final question? Okay. Well, thank you very much for these uh, interesting questions, and I'm happy to um, give the floor back to Una. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas Cartier. That was uh, an amazing uh, tour de force to... Uh, present so many ideas and um, with such authority. What's so amazing about Thomas is that you have both this deep knowledge, and it's a practical knowledge, and it's also a theoretical knowledge, and that hasn't made him hidebound and limited in his view. He's not simply um, an apologist for the WTO. He actually has this vast imagination and can see how to how the WTO can be moved forward to, uh, to basically create a better world. So I'm totally inspired, and, I, and I'm sure many of you in this room are too. And I'm particularly happy because we're having a discussion tomorrow, um, just a small group, to talk about our research agenda. And I kind of feel like he set it out for us already tonight. So tomorrow should be a breeze. So anyway, with that, I just want to say thank you very much to Thomas. And um, before you all leave, I just have a, a few little notes to tell you. There'll be an edited video of this event, um, the live webcast, that will be put up on the CG website in the next few days. And you're welcome to share that um, with friends or family, of course, through social media. And I also want to tell you that um, if this is the first time you've come to a CG event, please do sign up for our newsletter. You can do that in the foyer, and then you'll get updates on any events that we're doing. And finally, I just want to remind you that there are a few events coming up. Um, just ne next week, we have on February 9th, CG Senior Fellow Basma Mamani will discuss her new book, Arab Youth and the Democra Democra Demographic divide, excuse me. And then on February the 29th, CG Cinema Series presents a screening of the Kandahar Journals. You saw a video um, out of that with remarks by Louis Palou, who's the photojournalist and documentarian. And in March, we'll welcome Bruce Rydell, who was with the CIA for 30 years and is now a Middle East policy advisor at the Brookings Institute in Washington. And he'll discuss Saudi-US relations. So as I said, be sure to register online for the CG Events newsletter, or you can register in the foyer. And um, thank you once again for joining us both online and in person. Good evening. Thank you.